Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles 2008 Urban Lecture Series. I'm Fernando Guerra. I am the director of the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We established this lecture series over 10 years ago, and we did this primarily for three reasons. First and foremost, to provide an interdisciplinary education for hundreds of our students. Second, it is aired to over one million households like yours in the city of Los Angeles. Third, it also brings together government officials, business and community leaders, our students and others to discuss the challenges being faced by our city. For more information about the Urban Lecture Series, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and Loyola Marymount University, we welcome you to visit our website, which can be found at www.lmu.edu backslash CSLA. We hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we hope it inspires you to get involved in the challenges facing our great city. The Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Today we're gonna to talk about the environment and we have two great guests. One is our own professor who I will introduce in a second. And uh, the our other guest is on his way. It is Council Member Ed Reyes from the First District. Uh, but what we want to do is start talking about the river that the Council Member has. Um, are we going to talk about the river? We're going to talk okay. about the river. Okay. We're going to talk about the river, and we have a presentation for you uh, that uh, uh, Jill Sorial, who is the Environmental Deputy for the Council Member, is going to run us through. And so I'm going to go out there, and uh, she's going to run us through the... the uh, the uh, slideshow, and then we will, uh, by then the council member will be here and we'll uh, um, start our discussion. Okay, Ms. Soriel. Thank you, good evening. Um, before I get started with the PowerPoint, I'm just curious how many people here know that Los Angeles has a river? And how many people have been down there? What does it look like? A lot of concrete. There's some areas that have soft bottom and are more natural. Um, but we're gonna go through a little bit um, about the environmental uh, constraints of the river and also how we've really been looking at it, not only in terms of revitalizing um, environmental the environmental issues, but also looking at the social issues and the communities that surround the river and kind of how we've been using it as an organizing tool for some of these bigger issues. Um, So we started a process to look at the 32 miles of the river within the city of Los Angeles boundaries, um, and we developed a master plan. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of, of the process that we went through. Um, this is the entire length of the river. It's 51 miles, starting in the valley in Canoga Park. And um, you can kind of see the topography of LA. It's a basin, and the river drains into Long Beach. So this is the 32 miles that we studied. Um, and it has, it's kind of divided into these different reaches. Um, the majority of it, as I said, being encased in concrete, but there are some areas around this Glendale Narrows where there's more of a soft bottom. And then as you get into downtown, we have the additional challenge of having a lot of rail tracks that surround the river. This is the Army Corps of Engineers who um, in the 1930s are the ones who did put in the concrete um, as a flood control measure. Prior to that, when there was heavy rainfall, the river actually would change course. Um, it did a lot of property damage, and so the Army Corps had decided that concrete was the best solution. This is the actual work as they began construction on it. And this is what our river looks like today. This is the start of it. Um, that's actually Canoga High School. Um, and you can see that it serves the flood control purpose, but it doesn't do a lot of the other things that you would might hope for from a river in terms of open space and natural habitat and a functioning watershed. These are more pictures as it goes into the Sepulveda Basin in the valley. Winding through Studio City. This is the 134 freeway. Hey, Jill, is yes. school right there? Is that after a rain? Um, yes. It, you know, most of the year the river is dry and a lot of the water that you see in there is actually from our treatment plant. It's, um, it's, it's effluent from the treatment plant. Um, but when there is a rain event, it rises very quickly, which is what makes the river dangerous. Um, and so we're trying to balance how we keep that flood control capacity, but also try and soften the look of it and revitalize the river. So this was our focal point, really the river corridor. Um, you could look at the entire watershed, um, which 
from an environmental perspective is very important. And from a planning perspective, we decided we're gonna look at the corridor and see, begin here, and then work with other environmental efforts to, to look at the broader issues. And these were the goals that we wanted to achieve. So they were environmental goals. We wanted to create access to the river. Right now, it's very hard to get down there. Um, we, we wanted to look at bikeways and trails and really making it a greenway. Um, recreation and open space and then also the flood control. So uh, we've been building on efforts that have been going on for quite some time. A lot of community groups, um, government agencies, the County of Los Angeles, the Army Corps have been involved. Um, and so the city wanted to build on a lot of the work that's already been done. So we chose these opportunity sites as places to get started where we could actually really show some progress. Um, and we started out with kind of 20 opportunity areas and we narrowed them down to these five. So I'm gonna show those in more detail. You can see what they look like now and what we hope they'll look like as we continue with the plan. So the first one's Canoga Park. You can see that Canoga High School that you saw in the photograph earlier. Um, there's a lot of industrial uses to the south. In the north, there's some residences, um, not very well connected. This is what we would hope to do with it afterwards creating green space, allowing the river to meander a little bit, which actually allows you to clean some of it as well and infiltrate it. This is as you go further south. This is that 134 freeway again that you saw from the photo. Um, on the left is Griffith Park. On the right-hand side, a lot of industrial and then housing again. We really wanted to make some of those connections and, and do some water quality. You can see under the freeway, there's a confluence of the LA River and the Verdugo. They, can, they come together and it's a good opportunity to do some water quality treatment. This is another view of what it might look like. And this is if you're actually standing under the freeway, what it might feel like. Uh, this is Taylor Yard, which is actually in our council district. Um, it is an old industrial and rail use. Um, the state acquired a large parcel that is now, it's now open as a state park, but there's still a piece between the park and the river that we'd really like to, to connect. So this is what it could look like. And this is what it might be like if you're actually down at the river. You could break into some of the concrete and start to tear us back and allow some treatment wetlands. This is as you get closer to downtown. The state actually has another, it's another park that's open there right now. It's the Los Angeles State Historic Park, um, just northeast of Chinatown. Um, and this is kind of what we'd like to do. You can actually create an off-channel treatment that would slow the water down enough where you could get down there and touch it and have some recreational opportunities. So that was one of the major goals. And then connecting the park to the river. Right now, there's no access from the park to the river. This is what it might look like if you were down there. And you can see in this area, we do have rail. So we haven't eliminated the rail, but we've put it up on a trestle so that it can go through. Um, this is right next to the park. This is the Broadway Bridge. And right now, this is sort of the area that's blocking the park to the river. And this is what it could look like if you went under the rail and created some access down in there. And other cities have done it. It, it. We look at it now and it's hard to imagine, but there are cities who have done this work. This is downtown, roughly from 1st Street to 7th Street. This is what it might look like if you could green along the corridor. We're very constrained because we didn't want to take out any homes. We didn't want to flood the area. We wanted to see what we could do within the existing right of way down here. This is what it might look like if you were down in there. So we looked, we looked at other cities to see how they got started. We went to Denver. Um, they've done a lot of work along their river. And we noticed um, kind of how they created some economic value as well, created jobs, created reinvestment in the community while at the same time achieving the environmental benefits. Um, we looked at the greenways. We looked at how they achieved multiple benefits in, in small spaces, really, that they had to work with. This is actually um, in Seoul, Korea. This is a major freeway that ran through the heart of the city. And they, underneath it is their waterway that had been covered in concrete. 
So they actually took the freeway out. It's called daylighting. They daylighted the area. And this is what it looks like now. So you can actually go down there and walk along the river. So after we finished the, the master plan that had this kind of vision for what we wanted to see, we needed to think about some implementing tools. And so the planning department in the city of Los Angeles is, is putting together what's called the river improvement overlay. Um, it's basically a district that would run the length of the river and it would implement certain design guidelines. So if you're building a new home there, you might want to reorient it to face the river. You might want to think about the kind of landscaping you're putting in your home so that it's not using a lot of water. There's things that you can do to be more compatible and really start to create a riverfront district where one didn't exist in the past. And these are the kinds of things that we're trying to promote in this riverfront district. So looking at the entire corridor, where could you green some of the streets? Where could you create access? Um, where could you create open space and habitat? This is an example of a lot of the things you see facing the river now. There's kind of alleys. They've turned their back towards the river. And these are some of the things you could do as you start to green it and actually make those connections in there. Uh, green streets are another thing the planning department is looking at. So you can see at the bottom there, they've actually created places where the water and the runoff after a rain will infiltrate and it cleans it before it reaches the river because the river eventually then flows into the ocean through the storm drains. Some more examples of, of how you can create cultural spaces as well using art um, and architecture to make the river more inviting. Um, so looking at the river improvement overlay, this has not yet been approved by the city. We're in the process. We've been going out and conducting community meetings, asking people what they think the boundaries should be, how far away from the river should it go, um, what would the design guidelines look like for single family homes, for commercial buildings, for industrial buildings. So we've really trying trying to get feedback and ask people what they think would look best. And then we've set up, um, we're looking to set up a governance structure to keep this work moving forward. So right now, there's a lot of entities that have jurisdiction along the river. There's the county, there's the city, there's the Army Corps. There's actually private property ownership underneath the river. It's kind of a little bit tricky. And so we are working with the county to try and develop a joint powers authority so that um, decisions about maintenance and security and all of those sort of liability issues that we are um, looking at really in an ad hoc fashion right now can come together in one place and start to be addressed comprehensively. And then for the land use um, decisions and sort of what that river improvement overlay would do and what our planning department could do, we're looking at a river revitalization corporation and they could really start to look at um, how do you create investment in the area? How do you buy some strategic properties that would um, really help the revitalization efforts move along? And then the last is the River Foundation, um, which would really do fundraising and be the philanthropic arm of the river, um, looking at art and cultural events and all the kinds of things that you can do through a nonprofit. <coughs> this is our timeline. Um, the master plan was adopted in May of 2007. So we're still working now with the Army Corps of Engineers. They are doing a feasibility study at the federal level, which tells us where we could go in and break concrete um, and still maintain the flood control. So they need to go through their process. Um, the Army Corps' mission is really ecosystem restoration. And so they want to look at areas where we can bring back some of that habitat and where we can um, integrate the work that they do with the work that the city has been doing. Um, then the river improvement overlay, which I mentioned. Um, we're also going to be updating the community plans along the river. So the city has, um, the planning department has a general plan which kind of dictates how development will occur in the city. And it's divided into 35 community plans um, throughout the city that are a little bit more specific about what the communities will look like. So there are 10 community plans along the river that we'd like to go through and update. And um, right now, if you looked at the current community plans, they don't even really make mention of the fact that there's a river there. It's a flood control channel. You stay away from it. You don't, you don't plan around it. So we really want to change some of that so that the focus is how do you integrate the river, how do you integrate environmental principles into the future planning efforts. Um, and then demonstration projects where we really want to try and break the concrete and see what we can do. So that's our basic timeline. That's me. If you have any questions or further comments or want to get involved, that's how you can find me.
down. Thank you. Sure. And Councilman Reyes is on his way, but he's stuck in great LA traffic. And so we can ask him about that. Um, I'll just sit right here. Okay. I'm going to introduce to you, some of you might have had his classes, I don't know. This is uh, Professor John Dorsey. He received his bachelor and master's from Cal State Long Beach in biology and marine biology. Then he got exiled to Australia where he received his doctorate from the University of Melbourne in surfing, I mean zoology. <laughs> Presently, he's a uh, professor and chair of the Natural Science Department. He teaches courses in environmental and marine sciences and sciences for the honors program as well. Uh, prior to uh, LMU, he worked as a marine biologist for the city of Los Angeles, so he can talk a lot about uh, how it is working within the city. And he was focused on marine monitoring of the Santa Monica Bay and uh, storm water management. Um, he currently sits on many local and state technical committees dealing with water quality issues and policy and conducts research on the role of indicator bacteria in coastal water quality. John's passion is, of course, good water quality, mostly because he's a surfer. Uh, almost any day that you look out there on El Porto, you can see him surfing, right? Yeah, one of those guys. Uh, he's also involved with the Bologna Wetlands in terms of an LMU project that we have down there. And actually, I want to start talking to you a little bit about that. Uh, number one, really talk about your experience in the city uh, and how much greater it is to be at LMU than anywhere else. Uh, and, but also talk about uh, Bologna and then the water storm system, et cetera. But first, tell us about the Bologna Wetlands and the projects that you're currently doing. Right. Um, all of you guys know about the Bologna Wetlands, right? Who doesn't know about them? Okay. It's just like right there. Go outside, and I want you to look to the northwest. Those are the Bayana Wetlands, okay? On the other side of Lincoln. Okay, so it's a pretty extensive area, but it's not nearly as extensive as it used to be. It used to cover the entire marina and went all the way up to Venice. And when they built the marina in the 50s, they lost a huge amount of the wetlands. But back then, wetlands were considered swamps, okay? So um, to be drained and built upon, things like that. But we're finding out more and more some of the research I've been doing, a lot of the research being done by other scientists around the nation are showing that they're incredibly valuable for a variety of reasons. Biodiversity, uh, water quality work, a lot of different things. So what's going on down there is right now, um, it is now owned by the state of California. It is managed by the Fish and Game Department and it is now undergoing an extensive planning to try to bring it back to a more natural type of uh, functioning, okay? This is being spearheaded by the California Coastal Conservancy, and they've put together a whole group of stakeholders. I mean, there are probably over 100 stakeholders involved in this process, from local environmental groups, scientists, all sorts of different people. And they're putting together their ideas, their thoughts, their desires, their agendas, all sorts of things, and coming up with a plan. And I think we're just about ready to see, and also there's a science advisory group, and I sit on that. And so we take a look, we work with consultants that are hired by the state to help put together what's going to be a plan of action to try to bring it back to a more functioning wetland. We'll never get back to a natural state. It's just too many people crowded up right against it. But we can certainly do better than what we have now. And there's a lot of exciting ideas that are out there, and they're about ready to come up with a series of alternatives for the stakeholders to see. And it was very interesting to look at the LA River plan. It, they talked about softening up the concrete, getting rid of some of the concrete, putting in more natural vegetation, that sort of thing. Those are some of the very ideas that we have with the, uh, essentially the Bayana Creek estuary, which is all concrete right on down to the uh, Santa Monica Bay. Softening that up, making it more natural in there as it goes to the whole wetland area. So, so how, about L how, how about LMU students? How are they involved? All right, well, first of all, I get them down there all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're pretty lucky because I, uh, I have a, uh, a situation uh, with the fishing game where I could t I've got permission to go in there and do research with other faculty at LMU. I don't think anybody else has that particular permission. So we're doing a lot of a variety of studies down there with our students, especially during the summer. We've gotten a couple of grants to go down there and do undergraduate research work. So we're doing a, a variety of different things to get data that are needed by the people doing the restoration work. Also, our students are involved with um, certain public outreach programs. The Friends of the Bino Wetlands, 
they have some educational programs where they bring kids in. And we've had students acting as interns, and one just graduated. She's one of our alumni now, and now she's heading up that program. So our students are getting very much involved with that. There's going to be a discovery center associated with uh, down right below, uh, literally right below us here. And that's going to be talking about the wetlands and how they're connected with the bay and upland areas. And we hope to have student interns working in there in all different areas, not just science, but also management, economics, things of that nature. So when you walk out of this building right here and you get on LMU Drive mm -hmm. and you get to Lincoln, you turn right, okay? Head to the beach. Head to the beach. Head so the, the wetlands <laughs> are everything on the left, yeah. all the way down to the marina. Uh, well, and saw also some of it on the right when you pass the bridge. Yeah. It's essentially everything that's west of Lincoln. Okay. And as you go down, as you go down uh, Jefferson and then it goes into Culver Boulevard, both sides of you are the wetland areas. Right. Okay. And you'll pass this thing called a freshwater marsh as you're going down Lincoln. You guys have seen that, okay? Well, the, the traffic goes slow enough that they can see believe everything. Me, you can see it, especially in the morning. You got lots of time to look at it. <laughs> So you head on down there, and that's before you get to Jefferson. That whole marshy area is an artificial uh, wetland area that they constructed to essentially take runoff from the huge Playa Vista project and some of the Jefferson watershed. That's where everything, when it rains, it drains. And, it, and it's a natural, well, it's not an natural, artificial, but they've, it's been a tremendous success in the sense that you've got huge amounts of vegetation growing there. And, that's a purification type system. So I think we even have cranes have been nesting there. And Birds come. You build it, they will come. Yeah. And so what, what we call the Bologna Creek, what is that? Is that the, the channel that you see, or sometimes we call it the Bologna Channel yeah, right, well, uh, on the bridge? And that's what you're talking about, that's concrete on the both sides. And look very much like the river that we just saw. Oh, yeah, right? very much like so it. So yes. in your ideal situation, what would happen there? My ideal situation is that they would take out all that concrete. They've got to still maintain the flood control ability of the channel, of course, but they would soften it up. They would put vegetation in there. Maybe they could even take enough out to bend it around a little bit to make some little bit more open water areas in there. But they try to get it back to more of a natural type of situation. Okay. So we have, we saw the river. We have the Bologna wetlands here. The Venice Canals, we try to have some restoration there. There's some stuff going on also in Hanson Dam. What are some other projects within the city of LA that are similar to trying to restore some natural vegetation? Not necessarily make a, an active park, but uh, create a, a natural state where it once existed. Well, the county and the city, along with the Army Corps, are looking at the watershed, and for example, by Hanson Dam. You know what, explain what a watershed is, because I didn't know okay. what that was until <laughs> Well, it's kind of curious. I just found out myself a few years ago. But what it is... You know what? Let me, let me bother you for a second. I'm sorry. I need to properly introduce this person here. Thank uh, you, Dr. This is, yeah. <laughs> this is Council Member Ed Reyes. He represents the first district in the city of Los Angeles. You've met some other council members throughout this uh, lecture series. Uh, he has served on the city council since 2001. He was recently uh, re-elected in 2005 and will probably run for re-election in 09 as well. Last time he ran for re-election, he won with 75% of the votes. We're still looking for those other 25% of the voters. Um, he, he has taken on all kinds of uh, um, policies, but one of the things that, one of the terms that I really like that he uses is that he represents some of the old neighborhoods, including where I, I grew up, and he calls them the original suburbs of LA, the original suburbs from, from downtown Los Angeles. Um, you know, one of the things he did, I remember in the news, and it's also in his bio, that immediately when Chief Bratton uh, was appointed, he took Chief Bratton and met him go over to the neighborhoods to see what gang life was really like. And as you recall, we had Assistant Chief Jim McDonald here last week to talk about uh, gang violence and things that are, are, are happening there. Um, he is the chair of the City Council's Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Within City Hall, we call that PLUM, which are the initials of Planning Land Use Management Committee. You know, as we discussed in class, every piece of land has certain use. It's actually determined by the city, and it goes through the, um, his committee. We've also discussed in class that uh, the council at work is half the time the counseling committee. Almost every legislation has to go through there, and he is the chair of that and uh, has a major impact in determining what, uh, what occurs. 
I know that his agenda has been uh, about expanding the city's affordable housing stock, and we're going to be talking about housing uh, next week or the week after that, I forget. And he's also pushed for an adaptive reuse ordinance, which we're going to talk about, which impacts uh, downtown quite a bit, but other parts of the community. Um, and he's also uh, I mean, I can go on and on about uh, many of the different things that, that he's done. Uh, d dealt with the MTA. We had uh, Roger Snowball here last week to talk about the NPA and, and the gold line. Uh, I missed it. Okay. Yeah, you missed it. I sent you an invite. Um, yeah, he, uh, one of the most important things, of course, is he's opened at least four new libraries in, in his district. And as we talked about, and um, Jill mentioned, is he is the chair of the Los Angeles River Ad Hoc Committee, which is very important. He uh, attended... UCLA, where is that? Hmm. <laughs> some neighbor up north. Yeah, some, okay, I, mean, we, I know we, I've heard of it. Um, where he got a degree in English and a master's degree from the Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, he, of course, has to live in the first district where he does, and his, he's got uh, his wife of 19 years, Martha, and he's got four children. All right, so that is uh, Councilman Ed Reyes, and thank you for uh, showing up. So now let's get back to what we were talking about. Right. Well, first I apologize. I wish we would build that rail line to the beach. Yeah. Probably would have gotten here a lot quicker. I was actually stuck at the other school at USC, so the traffic there is terrible. But anyway, it's good to be here. I really enjoy working with students and having these engagements because we talk about concepts. You have ideas that a lot of folks don't even consider, but because of that sense of optimism and and looking at our world from a different perspective, I always appreciate this energy. Well, thank Jill for helping me out uh, starting this off uh, while I got here. But the fact is, uh, as a person who grew up in the inner city, uh, in Lincoln Heights and Cypress Park, um, there are some experiences that, that you go through that you think everyone else is going through. But when you go to a different campus, you go to a different neighborhood, you realize it's not, every, it's not like that. It's not like that everywhere else. That there are other places where you can play and, and you know, have a playground and, and play baseball and, and, and not have to deal with the smog and the noise of freeways. And so as, as, as I go through this process of becoming a council member and chair of land use, we started looking at these issues of the watershed. And why was that important? Because the areas where I grew up, we didn't have the green line streets. Uh, we didn't have access to, to parks or, uh, this is going to sound a little awkward, when I first went to the beach, I was about 16 years old. You mean well, you never been to the beach before? Right. But you grew up in L.A.? I grew up in Los Angeles. And for those of us who grew up in working class communities and communities where transportation is difficult or you have other priorities, uh, going to the beach is not that, that common. And when you look at our densities, in my district, I have census tracts where you have 60,000 people in a census tract when the city average is 6,000. So when you look at the concentrations of people, the issues of density are very real, so. So what's the neighborhood like that, like Pico Union or Pico places? Union, Westlake, Lincoln, actually Pico Union, it's higher, it's 90,000. So 90,000 person, persons per in a census, census tract is usually anywhere from uh, a, a square mile to three square miles? Right. So th and the city average is about three to 6,000 people. So when you start looking at the city, and you start looking at the issues of South LA, Southeast LA, South Central, East LA, Northeast, I have to show you a map, you would see that these densities are really intense. And these are thousands and thousands of people living in these pockets. Now, you start shifting over to the western part of the city, those densities dramatically drop. The council districts dramatically change. I have a 13 square mile district with 250,000 people. Some of these districts are 54 square miles with the same number of people. So when you look at the boundaries of districts and how neighborhoods have evolved, they have evolved in a very lopsided way. And it is not coincidental that a lawsuit in the 1980s, 1985-86, forces the city to actually draw new districts where representation that reflects the people that live in the city can actually have a chance to become Policymakers that actually created the district that you now hold because exactly. Gloria Molina held it, then Mike Hernandez, and then and myself. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does that have to do with the watershed? Well, oh, yeah, that was the original question. Okay. What is a what is a watershed? So I'm trying to connect the dots here, folks. Mm -hmm. See, the watershed is about how the water flows when it rains, when it comes down through 
the natural topography of a terrain. It has places where it flows, where it collects, and it finds the lowest point, and gravity pulls it out into the ocean. So the watershed are all these natural habitats and natural systems by which the water actually behaves. So you have natural pockets of, of habitats, you have uh, valleys, you have ravines, you have river systems, you have tributaries, you have creeks, and all of these are byproducts of what water does and when, it, when it nourishes the land and it generates life. And these are essentially the locations where if you go back to prehistoric times where people start settling and developing and actually creating civilizations and, and, and gathering points. Los Angeles is founded on the bend of the river around Elysian Park. When they first get to this part of the territory, the Poladores from San Gabriel Mission, that's the place that they settle, and that's where they do their first campsites. If you look at uh, the diaries of Father uh, Serra, that's what he talks about. He talks about what he saw when he looked down the river valley, heading north towards Glendale, the, the Glendale Narrows, He's looking west, he's looking towards downtown, where you see Alvera Street. Now this is the birthplace of our city, and this is where you start seeing this, this type of evolvement. So the watershed is about how the water flows, how it essentially behaves, and how it nurtures natural habitats. And essentially, we are at a point in our region where we have become so advanced and so wise that we've done a great job of really disturbing this watershed in the way in which we failed to capture the water, we have destroyed natural habitats, we have essentially polluted our underground water tables, what people call aquifers. We have this huge lake under the city of Los Angeles. If you go to where Dodger Stadium is at, and you look over toward the northeast, towards Pasadena, you see like this, this, this formation of hills. They're called the, um, the Mount Washington uh, foothills. And they go towards Glendale. And then you see Lision Park, that basin, underneath it about, I don't know, 300, 400, 500 feet, there's this huge body of water that goes all the way to the San Fernando Valley. Well, because of the gas stations and the industrial plants, we've contaminated, contaminated that, that, that water body underneath. And it's a, it's a Superfund site that was established back in the 70s and 80s. Can, can I ask you, is that unique to Los Angeles, though? I mean, no. obviously, most cities get established by rivers or by seaports. Right. Why? Because they're, it's for commerce, they're easy to protect, right. and it was for transportation and those type of things. Exactly. So LA, we like to think of Los Angeles as unique, and in many respects it is, but the way it gets settled is not unique. Okay? Now, we in Los Angeles and many other industrialized cities throughout the world have ruined their environments. Are we worse about the same, a little bit better? Because you talk about pollution, but we see this Mexico City, China, you see it all over the place. I just think that we are at a critical stage where if we understand what we're doing to our environment in some very basic ways, then we should be in a position to start creating the environments where we can help it heal. Mm -hmm. And so when we start looking at the factory, the end of the pipeline mentality, and where everything we resort to is technology and, and steel and, and, and artificial material as opposed to allowing nature to help heal, um, we're going to continue getting ourselves into this uh, doomsday scenario. I mean, right. just yesterday, the day before, you talked about that large section of the, of the ice cap that is breaking off. Now, that is directly to the fact that we are generating heat. Now, when you look at, and, and I'm going a little, it's on the side, but if you look at the thermal map of, of our world in the 70s, Tokyo, Japan saw that back in the 70s, their thermal map, their dot was, was deep red. They started introducing green rooftop policies in which their green rooftops actually after 20 years started cooling down that thermal. We've never done that. So we're introducing those concepts. So, okay, now, now why haven't we done that? Because economic interest, most of the businesses would say, listen, if you, in a sense, what they say is, we've been polluting, we understand that. But if we stop polluting, we're going to have to stop employing people, we're going to take the job somewhere else, um, so you can't make us do that. And I, that's, I think, a very nearsighted and, and myopic way no, of No, it's totally at nearsighted and myopic, but, 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 but um, that's what, what they're arguing, though. I, I understand. So that's why we have you 
and the professor here and myself having these discussions, because we then can talk about alternatives. We can talk about different ways of looking at our systems. For example, if you look at the Los Angeles River, and we start looking at how we break up these cement walls and start actually do what they call stormwater harvesting, where you capture the water when it rains, where you do what they call polishing the water, in which you introduce natural habitats that can actually absorb and consume some of this bacteria and some of this pollutants as a natural feeding process of its ecosystems, you're creating green locations that generate oxygens that neutralizes these types of negative impacts caused by sounds like by a biologist, cement. doesn't he? I mean, so, he's supposed to be a, a, a politician. You but, sound like a... a well, well, the fact is, is that we need to put a dollar value to open space and green space and green industries so that does translate into good business mm -hmm. and job generators. We should be collecting the type of technology that you see in other countries and create green industries that actually stimulates jobs, makes us environmentally friendly, cools down our environment, and actually generates jobs near the Los Angeles River along these corridors that actually have a true impact on those youngsters today that are suffering high levels of lung ailments because of the contamination caused by the freeways and trucks that are going through these poorer areas where it was relegated that we wanted, we want the comforts of, of modern society, but we want the burden to be placed in that neighborhood, right. not or, over here. Or the next generation. Right. right. Yeah. So, John, you worked at the city of LA for how many years? Uh, just about 20. 20 years. What did you do there? Well, I started off from about 1983 as a marine biologist working on Santa Monica Bay, primarily looking at what was going on around the big Hyperion outfalls. And the Hyperion plant next to the airport. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, from about 1998 to when I came here full time, 2002. Most of that time you were also teaching here part time. I, I, yeah, I taught part time yeah. since 85. Right. Um, I was focused on stormwater. And I was stationed downtown, and I considered that like stormwater central because some of the worst stormwater pollution I've ever seen is actually going into the LA River. <laughs> I know. Some of the highest bacterial counts I've ever measured. But in tell my them career. about the stormwater system, I mean, you know, the, the gutters and the. Right. Okay, all those streams and tributaries and what have you, they're all storm drains. Okay, we've turned them into concrete, we've covered them up, most of them. The only the largest channels are the ones that you actually can see when you drive across the streets and over these big open channels. And so the stormwater system is like a huge bush, thousands of miles of it. And everything that gets put into, actually the street is part of the stormwater system. The curbs in the street, they're there to keep water from flooding into adjacent properties. Whatever you, anybody throws in that street is going to eventually wind up down into the ocean. If it goes down the LA River, it's going to be down there by the Queen Mary in Long Beach. If it goes um, in the west side and a whole bunch of cities and the Bionic Creek watershed. So every time you're walking yeah. down the street and you throw a piece of paper or trash or anything, or you leak oil, right. it all ends up going into the storm water system right. and it ends up coming right to the ocean. Exactly. Everything. Exactly. You don't pick up after your dog, guess where it goes. And you like to surf, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what they call the urban slobber, right? Yeah. I call it a lot worse than okay. that. Okay. <laughs> Depends where you're at. Yeah, I know. It's, um, it's always worse when it rains, right? Because it washes you know, everything. Look, my, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, regulations that are being put into place right now. The cities, the cities have a very tough task ahead of them because the cities are responsible for essentially complying with a whole bunch of stormwater regulations. And this is going beyond what technology could do at the moment for a lot of these things, but their cities are really trying hard to do it. Um, I'm not going to get into all the technical acronyms and all that kind of stuff, but the city of LA, I know for a fact, is working in a lot of different ways to figure out ways to comply with regulations, which means getting trash out of the LA River and the Bayana Creek uh, systems. Now think about it. How many of you guys have gone down to the beach after a heavy rainstorm around here? Raise your hands. Okay. Did you like what you saw? No, it's terrible. Don't go in the water. I think, well, see, that's a problem. My dream is to be able to go out surfing right after a storm because we get our best waves in the height of storms or right when they're coming in and sometimes right after um, without having to worry about what I can't see in the water, and that would be the bacteria and viruses. And so, like, I sit there on the beach with my buddies. Okay, uh, the waves are great. It's just stormed. 
We've had a lot of runoff, but the current's heading up to Venice Beach, Vina Creek. Would it get down here? I don't know. The guys at Venice, they're on their own. Let's go out. Let's take a chance, okay? Been surfing LA waters for 45 years. My kind of like you, you went through the same decision process that a lot of students go about other things. That you oh, were just yeah. like, you're, you know, you're not supposed to do it, but you just justified it. Can't happen to me. No, that's right. Okay. Yeah, can't happen. I just to wanted to show. I just wanted you guys to understand that professors do yeah. use that very same rationale that you all use to do all kinds of different things. Does that make uh, you feel go better? Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So my dream is I don't have to go through that thought process, and I think one of the real valuable ways of doing that is. All the stuff we do when it's not raining. The LA River uh, revitalization program, you saw a lot of places where they're putting in parks, they're putting in more vegetated areas. We, th that's a big multi-use thing. First of all, water quality. Um, you know, had mentioned about water soaking into the ground. Microorganisms break down things like oils and organic debris and all that kind of stuff. They purify the water. Also, that's fantastic place, needed places for people. People love being in parks. They love being at least out away from the tight urbanization that we have so much of us around here. So the more, the more we've paved over LA, and I've heard of one movement called Unpave LA, where we're trying to reduce the amount of asphalt out there. I think like like well, where? I mean, I don't want it down my street. I don't want a muddy street. Well, what about the playgrounds in the in the uh, schoolyards? Oh, that would well, be great. Well, I, well, actually, we're introducing new policies for how we look at these green streets. Okay, so well, not let me to be ask paid, you that, to be that, permeated. Okay, so answer that question, what you're just doing in the context of this. You hear the scientists, the activists. We all know there's pollution out there. Okay. We all know that it's happening. We all know that we have to stop. Okay, why aren't we? I believe that we are trying to do that. No, I know we're trying. Five <laughs> years. Why aren't we? No, we are doing it when you start looking at the policies we're introducing. If you look at the permeated services we're introducing with new uh, developments, that's addressing it. When you look at the green rooftops, that's addressing it. When you start looking at, have you seen all those uh, metal cages on top of the, cor at the, at the corners where you cover the sewers? Well, all of that is geared towards capturing the trash all right. before it gets to the river. Catch basin covers. The catch yeah. basin covers. We're trying to introduce these, these caissons and these, we're looking at other cities like Berlin, Germany, where we want to introduce these concepts along the riverway, where we actually start capturing the trash, filtering them out before it gets to the ocean. It's a cost issue. So to address the cost issue, we're putting together a, a river corporation, a foundation. We're looking at the re-entitlement of whole sections of our city. I'm talking about re-entitlement, it's like when you change the zones. So certain pockets where you can only build maybe uh, a certain type of buildings. Well, we want to increase the ability to do that if they are going to participate in our improving these greenways and creating a river district that actually augments and, and further enhances what has been done in the past, but at a greater scale within the watershed. And, and that's a methodology that we're trying to introduce, to introduce so that we can get this, the culture of the city to change. And, and that's very hard to do. It's like we're, we're trying to get this big ship to change direction and how we manage, how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's difficult, so we're doing it on an incremental using, basis. Using, and using the same analogy, how could it be so difficult? Everybody on board, from the captain on down, can see that you're about to hit an iceberg and you say change, and they're still not changing. It's like... I, I beg to differ. I think we are changing. I think when you look at what the River Committee has done in the past five years, when you look at this master plan that was funded with three million from Department Water Power, when you look at the 25 to 45 million being considered by the feds, last week we had uh, Colonel Magnus, uh, uh, Congress member, he is Army Corps of Engineer handling the Western region, along with the mayor and Congress member Becerra and Lucy Roy Aldert and, and the county supervisor. We're trying to figure out, okay, how do you get these giant bureaucracies to work together, which is something that's never happened in the past. And it's a focal point based on creating these opportunities so that we can have demonstration projects along the river that amplifies what's just been stated in terms of how we can use the natural habitats to deal with this contamination. There's Professor, Professor Dorsey, you're an activist, you're an academic, but you're also a practitioner. You worked in the city, you're on all kinds of technical. What's, what's it gonna take for the city to change and other governments? Um, you know, the city, they've got a huge mission to try to do this, these changes. 
but they got to be partnered with the, the citizens. The citizens have a responsibility also. They need to somehow get a better sense of environmental stewardship, of pride in their communities. I think that's what we're missing too. They, it's going to be done to the kids. You, you, you know, the adults are sort of ingrained in their ways. I think it's the kids who are going to really learn this. They need to understand that they have to throw that cup in a solid waste stream. They have to put in the trash. You go out at the Bayana Creek at the rainstorm, it's a sea of plastic. Well, it's all you see out there are foam cups. Um, maybe some corporate responsibility. Do we need to, we're the fast food, easy convenience society. It's, it's almost you're talking a societal change. Do we need to have everything in the clam plastic uh, things? Do we have to have every, everything is supposed to be the foam cups. Can we switch out to a different kind of packaging system? Do we need all that packaging? Okay. Yeah. You obviously so can't let me carry ask you. And, and hands, and what's, Dr. Gillard, I just want to add yeah, that. Go ahead. Each item he's singled out, we've addressed through policy changes. We've challenged the plastic bag industry. We are at a place where we're seriously thinking about either charging money for plastic bags or just getting rid of them altogether. Uh, we're introducing recyclable material, so but when did, you go did shopping, that, did pick that it up. pass? Yes, we did so, pass the, the, the. But I just went to Ralph's the other day and got no, a plastic we, bag. No, what we passed is is working with the plastic bag industry mm -hmm. to get them to use recyclable material. Uh, right now, we're looking at the state. We need to change the language at the state level because they put forth a law that says we cannot do it. We cannot allow it. So we're, that's what we're trying to change. Okay. So we're in the middle of that right now. Uh, so the points that you've been making, mm -hmm. we've been addressing in through the policy okay. and trying to get it enforced. Now the citizens have to do their Okay, share. what exactly. specifically can this group of LMU students individually and collectively, whether it's Daniel or Laura or Luis or whoever, tomorrow, what can they do or not do that would help improve the environment of Los Angeles? Okay, how many drive cars that are probably 19... 99 and older. Okay, keep them tuned up. They leak. Okay, so don't have any leaky cars. They're leaking oil, stuff like that. Yeah, but what if it's about paying tuition so that they can pay you and me or doing the car? Well, what? Put, put a piece of cardboard underneath it and throw it in your trunk, okay? <laughs> Say, there you go. Very simple uh, yeah, solution. Yeah, very simple. Makes you got to come up with simple solutions, huh. okay? Um, so you, carry a piece of cardboard. Yeah, yeah, carry a piece of cardboard in your yeah. trunk. Uh, when you work out, you know, you don't have to always buy the bottles like this. I always keep a bottle um, that I just fill up with. The L.A. water is good water. You don't oh, need man, to buy but that's not cool. Stuff. You know when you go to the gym, you got to come up with an Avion bottle and all that kind of stuff. DWP just doesn't cut it. I'm not but it's good guy. water. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's good water, but it's all about the image. And it's not expensive. <laughs> so get a, get a really cool-looking water ball to fill up, okay? Fake it. <laughs> cool. Fake it. That, that says LMU or something. LMU, there you go. Pretend. <laughs> um, when you go to the store, uh, I'm glad, that's, I think City of Santa Monica, are, they're working on the plastic sack business. I'm glad to hear that we are now in City of L.A. Mm -hmm. I got a whole car full of canvas bags. I finally took me forever to collect these, but... Get in the habit of taking those when you go shopping. So that way you don't even have to use the plastic, okay? Stuff like that. So I mean you take your own bag into the market yep. and then you give it to them to put your groceries yep. in there, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. You know, just simple things. When I walk across the beach, I always make a point of picking up a piece of trash on the way down to the water, believe me, there's plenty of it there to pick up, and then on the way back, pick up some trash and put it in the trash can. Do, you know, teach by example. And I noticed the other day, it was pretty cool, because I was walking across the beach, and I noticed one of my buddies, he went over and did the same thing. And I thought, oh, thank God he finally learned something, you know. And, so and you're, you're not talking about fellow professors, though, when you say buddies. Oh, no, no. Okay, no. I, I just I thought All that. my crew is, um, it's a whole different group of people. Okay. <laughs> All right, so today, unfortunately, we're only going to go until about 6.30, so I'm going to start uh, uh, and open it up in, in terms of, of questions that you have. And as always, I... Uh, uh, reserve the uh, uh, first questions for any faculty. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Uh, Mara Marks, who's way over there. We got a mic for you, so hold on. So uh, Paulina is going to have the mic, and so if you have a question right now in terms of what, what and, and I might call on you in terms of what you do every day, so we can criticize your environmental behavior. So <laughs> if you pay attention. This question is probably a little bit more for the councilman, but my students are all writing these term papers about. Um, 
whether or not voters who are mostly older and white um, perceive that they have a shared interest with the younger generation, which is white, black, Latino, whatever. And I'm just wondering if some of these environmental issues you guys are talking about might be a way to link those two groups of people together and make voters feel like they've got some kind of stake in the future. I think that's a great observation. Um, when you look at the tendency of where that demographic lives, the older white, they tend to be along the coastal areas or the western part of Los Angeles. But the trash, the high trash areas because of the density and the way the infrastructure has evolved since the turn of the century begins where the younger uh, people of color live. And so there is a grassroots movement in the Latino community, in the African American community, in the Asian community. Uh, you have Koreans, you have uh, uh, Latinos, you have African Americans. We're, we get together and have these massive alley river cleanups. Uh, there's a foundation being formed for, to create jobs for youth. And you're finding that demographic getting involved. So you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a great way to start breaking through the class issues and the ethnic issues, because the environmental issue affects everyone. Yeah, and, but there's, and, th and therein lies that commonality. Yeah, but there's a perception that the environmental, that the environmental movement is mostly white. That, well, well I mean, that's I, a perception. I consider, I consider you an environmentalist. Okay, but the perception is that it's mostly white, west side, hippie types. No, no, when, when, you, when you look at the Latino culture, let me, let me just let's focus on for a second. When you look at the remedies, they're remedies based on nature, herbs, natural, uh, organic ways of dealing with illnesses and sicknesses. That goes back generations. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing with the Asian community. I um, mean, it's amazing what, uh, how can I say this? Environmentalism is ingrained in the DNA of the culture yeah, because of the way they were able to deal with these kinds of issues without chemicals. Mm -hmm. But in modern politics, the Sierra Club, for instance, is considered the number one environmental organization nationally. It's also come out to be very restrictionist, and some Latino organizations even consider it close to being anti-Latino in terms of some of the behavior that policy statements that they've taken on. Right. Immigration, birth control, things of, things of that, that population, uh, not, excuse me, not birth control, I should control myself. Uh, <laughs> po uh, population, birth rates, et cetera. Well, and again, it's, it's about image and perception, mm -hmm. but in reality, when you look at the behaviorisms and the way, the cultures, there's, there's this, uh, a dicho, it's a saying in Spanish, corriendo el voz. It's using word of mouth to pass on traditions. That is very indigenous and that's very natural. And it parallels the same objectives that the same environment that you're speaking yeah. about. No, no, and it's just a matter of being able to share that information. But I think it's the way the media portrays uh, these issues. And when you get the movie star that's willing to stand up or sit in a tree for days on end, and they're part of, a, of the Sierra Club, I mean, that gets the publicity. And that's where the images start coming in. When in fact, there's a whole other reality out there given on, on the day-to-day -day practices of many of the, of the ethnic cultures. Yeah, Caitlin? Um, I have a question about the river revitalization plan. Um, in creating the greenways, to what extent are you emphasizing native um, greenery, and to what extent are you anticipating invasive plants? Um, we we want to go all native all the time. For the simple reason, you need less watering. Uh, when you get the native plants to to take on their, their natural uh, communities. Uh, it's what came with the earth before we messed it up, before we did what we did to it. Uh, the, the, uh, the other types of plants that are obtrusive, it's, it's gonna be very labor intensive to pull it out and to control it. Uh, but it is a very critical issue and it dominates the scenario of how we evolve in, in this uh, corridor development. No, this is a little quick follow up to that. Um, when we do re-establish native plants in areas like that, we're going to have to be willing to also do the maintenance to make sure they get established because weeds, non-native weeds, could quickly get right in there. Mm -hmm. That's what we see all over the place. But once they're established, then hardly any watering, and they attract the native uh, animals, yep. the insects, the birds, and what have you. Janelle? Hi. OK, this is a question for either Professor Dorsey or Councilman Reyes. I know that really um, more liberal cities like Malibu and Santa Monica, and I want to say some parts of San Francisco, have recently banned uh, expanded polystyrene, or more commonly known as styrofoam. And 
um, like all the restaurants had to change over to the more expensive um, like cardboard or foil containers. Is this something that you're pushing across the city of LA and do you think that's feasible cost-wise for some of the smaller restaurants? Well, we are starting with baby steps. We are pushing that policy just within the city facilities. Uh, we want to, as Professor has said, um, teach by example. So the city of Los Angeles, we're not going to be using polystyrene or, or that material. You mean in like city employees and, si and city government agencies and exactly. all that? Exactly. Right? So we want to phase it out within city operations, get the infrastructure in place to deal with it, and hopefully expand it. And it also gives the business side of the, of the issue a chance to respond and hopefully get them to cooperate. So John, do you know whether LMU uses that or not? I mean, that's something we can talk about and... and uh, yeah, we, uh, it's a mixed bag here in, on campus. A plastic bag. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mixed plastic bag and yeah. styrofoam. Yeah. I, well, know, there's an issue where students can actually the, say to the administration, you know, hey... We don't need foam, okay? We just don't need it. I'm noticing that over in the lair, I'm not seeing any foam over there anymore. It's all paper, which is good. But you go into different departments and stuff, and you go into the kitchens where there's staff meets and all that, and you'll see foam cups and all that. So we could, we could do a much better job around that, of that around here. Real quick, I'm, I'm happy to see us getting rid of those foam cups and plastic because if you notice, when that stuff breaks down, it, does, it just gets into smaller bits of plastic and smaller, gets out into the ocean, and it looks just like the stuff that marine life feeds on, particularly yeah. birds and fish. Yeah. And uh, they've done studies on dead seabirds and opened them up and looked at the stomachs and they're full of plastic pellets or little bits of styrofoam. So the more we can get rid of that and reduce it, the better off we'll be. Actually, there's, I was told there's an island out there floating made up of this material that's a huge size. I don't uh, know that sounds like an urban myth. Yeah. Not an urban myth, a uh, marine myth. Whatever. Actually, one of my students is doing a term paper on that. And it's, you go out into the, the edge of what they call the North Pacific Gyre, okay? It's where the currents are, we've got this huge gyre system going around the uh, Pacific, North Pacific Ocean. And in the middle, there's not a lot of action going on. If you go out there with a net, you're not going to see like floating islands of trash. But if you go with a plankton net, about half the material you get are little bits of plastic. And that's being incorporated by the plankton out there. And this is like thousands of miles off the beach. Right. So, I mean, we're turning into a plastic planet when <laughs> you get down to it. So, hey, we got the next question for you. It's probably going to be for Council Member Reyes and how do you win an election? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I got he, five minutes left. Well, no, no, he, he's running for uh, student body office. All right, she's supported. Um, actually, <laughs> <laughs> this question's for, for Jill, actually. I think it's a really cool idea. Um, to beautify the river systems and and to create like more greenery for communities. But at the same time, about two weeks ago, we had one of the highest ranking police officers um, sit up here and tell us that the city is sorely lacking money to hire more police officers that we like really badly need. So I'm wondering like where where the funding for this river is gonna come from and like what priority does that take in regards to things that probably are more important, like hiring more police officers. <laughs> well, let's, let's, I will try to be as... Hey, are we hiring too many cops? As a thing, no, we need more, actually. Oh, but wait a minute. If we hire more cops, there's less for environment, there's less for schools, there's less for um, all kinds of different things. Why do we need so many cops? For the simple reason that we haven't cultivated and dealt with our neighborhood environments where we can nurture our kids not to be sucked into the gang culture. Which yeah, means cops, we need more cops park only space, deal with the end which result. means we they need don't, more they, park they space, they're not preventive. which means we need more park space, we need more positive development for housing, which means activating the dormant pieces of land along Council the river member. that's going to generate money that will create I, a different tax base that could create the kind of funding that can pay for more cops. So we have to wait for more open space until we hire no, more no, cops. I'm saying you cultivate and change the dormant dead space along the river to stimulate the tax base that helps us get more cops. Councilman, you have a hundred bucks next year, an extra hundred bucks. With that extra hundred bucks, you can hire another cop or another acre of park. What are you going to do? You can't have both. We're going to hire another cop to, okay, help to help organize the community investors he'll, he'll be a park and ranger. the community parents <laughs> Hang out with to help clear out the land to create that park. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> it, has done, it has happened. All right. No, I agree. Uh, no. Look at I the cornfield. Look at the Taylor Yard. 
Look at Visa Hermosa and Belmont. Okay. That I really happened. I agree with you, but next year, you're gonna, you are going to vote on the budget very soon, and you're going to put a bunch more money to hire cops right. instead of doing other things. Yes. That is true. Okay. And that in of itself will create a positive impact because our neighborhoods will be safer, our business will flourish, more people will come to our neighborhoods because then they won't have to fear getting shot. Yeah. Can I, I just add <laughs> that there is well, some... All, Jill, only if you contradict them. <laughs> well, there is some money that you as voters actually passed as a property tax that's specifically allocated as water quality money. It's PROPO in the city of Los Angeles. It's $500 million. And um, folks voted to tax themselves because they felt it was so important. So that stream of money is specifically dedicated to water quality improvements. Okay. Look, I, I'm going to have to let the council member go. So anybody else have questions for the council member? Come over here real quick. Okay, John, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, this is for Councilman Reyes. Um, yes, are there any plans within the re revitalization plan or any side plans that uh, are going to use the water for non-potable uses out of the LA River or for irrigation and other? Sources? Yes. Yeah, but before you answer that, let me get the other question so that you can answer both okay. of them. Okay. okay. Um, Miguel. Just ask one, no? Just no. ask one, no? Sorry? You, you can ask two. All go, right. Go ahead. You're a double um, major in political science Chicano studies, so you get two questions. Oh, yeah. So um, <laughs> my, in terms of the West Side communities, uh, the gentrification, I notice is really linked to like the destruction of natural uh, ecosystems and habitats, like which really ruins the biodiversity along the West Side, given, say, like along the Bayona Creek, the Mar Vista Gardens housing projects. Last year, they put, um, T-Mobile put in, um, uh, I guess, like a tower for like reception. It's emitting a lot of uh, like radiation. It's a primarily undocumented community of color. So right. what can we do to like further like you know to get it out of this white hippie mainstream movement and realize that you know affects us as people of color too right. and and stop sec using your cell phone no, and well, I don't do burn <laughs> it you know and second of all um <laughs> how, how can um you said you mentioned uh, using a uh, like I guess indigenous practices how can we create a space or like within communities of color how can the city of LA help in funding spaces to help undomesticate our youth because if anything we need less of a police force and more of a community organizing and I think that bringing our people of color, kids of color, back into their roots and yeah. so the, like, our practices can really help, so. Well, I appreciate yeah. what you're saying. Hold on. <laughs> Anybody else have a question for the council member? Yeah, 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 you can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got the question from John and okay. then the uh, radical uh, Chicano. Looking at our, I love that guy. Hey, that was me 20 years ago. Yeah, no, actually. Um, the, the fact is, we are trying to figure out, and this is what we're challenging the Department of Engineering and Public Works, that if we can get some of the gray water that does come from the river after it's treated, to have it recycled back out into the community so we can rejuvenate our aquifers by stimulating a different water source, a gray water source for our landscaping along our parkways, especially in the area, older parts of town where you don't have those parkways and greenways because of the lack of watering and the fact that they were designed without those parkways in mind. So we stimulate the aquifers and we generate a whole new methodology wait, wait, of dealing with minute, that. Wait a minute, So you're gonna take the toilet water and only on the east side, you're gonna get the radicals all, you know, all annoyed that only on the east side are we gonna use toilet water. Well, first of all, water. you're saying there's toilet water in the Alley River? Yeah. I said this water's no, no. coming from the Alley River. Oh, okay. Gray water. Oh, I'm sorry. Gray water. Gray water. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I did make a mistake. I meant to say gray water. I'm sorry. You gotta be I didn't mean toilet water. I got to get this guy every once in a while. Okay. So, um, but, so you're going to use gray water only on the east side? No, I, you, didn't, I the, didn't say only. The Chicanos are going to complain. No, you said only. Oh, okay. I did not say right. only. When you look at the river system, the river system has Compton Creek. It has tributaries in the valley, in the nice, nicer parts of the valley, okay. where high-income people live. You can regenerate this gray water and get it out into the community and stimulate these greenways. So that's another alternative to using the water. Now to address the, the gentleman's uh, point about impact on indigenous communities, imagine if we are able to look at these new parkways as gathering points where there is a sense of relief for the youngsters who don't have a place to play. We do have the three families in one bedroom apartments or three or four families in those two bedroom homes in these other parts of the city. There is no relief. If we can secure them with police and have the ability for kids to be there, you have a different meeting point, a different place in which you could actually engage people and, and, and take advantage of what's happening in, in those areas. 
From my point of view, we have to get the parents much more involved in that type of, of, a, of an environment. Uh, when we had the shootings in Cypress Park and Glassell Park, we're finding out that the parents weren't participating, and now they are because they're being stimulated by the principals, by fear, and by the fact that they don't have a gathering point to go to. Uh, but unfortunately, we're designing them in such a way where we make sure that they feel insulated from drive-by shootings. So we're actually designing them physically so that you can have this point of relief, this sanctuary, where you can have those gathering points. When we started the Taylor Yard, one of the first ceremonies that occurred out there is when we had uh, folks from Central America, the indigenous priests, who came out and actually had three-hour ceremonies uh, worshiping the different uh, elements. And it blew me away. I had never been in a ceremony like that. But there was, there a, was lot a lot of, uh, of, of, of rituals that spoke to how you respect and honor earth and all the elements. And that's coming from the neighborhood. So we have these opportunities to go forward. As far as the, the cells, in terms of the, the towers and those intrusive elements uh, that people say are affecting us uh, from our health point of view, it's a real tough one for me because the way the city was built out in the, 19, in, uh, in the late 40s and 1951, Supreme Court said you could no longer have covenants on our property titles that said no blacks, no Mexicans, no Chinese, and no dogs on our, on our actual uh, covenants that allow people to sell and buy homes. Well, that pattern that was set at the turn of the century all the way up to the 40s and 50s has changed. What didn't change is where they put the freeways, where they put the railways, where they put the power lines, and it was relegated to the areas in which you did not have these covenants. And so these enclaves grew in such a way where historically you have this lopsided city. Now we need to be positive and talk about the good things we can do as a society and start changing that and look at the riverway as one of those vehicles that introduces these concepts that talks about nature, creating relief and sanctuary for the families and kids so they can be nurtured and hopefully not need as many police officers as we need today. Cool. Thank hey, you so let's much. Let's thank the council member for coming out here. <laughs> and his uh, environmental deputy for making the presentation on the... Uh, okay. Why don't you follow up on some of the stuff that he was talking about? Right. Who's heard the uh, term toilet to tap? Anybody out there hear that? Okay. If you knew this water came from a sewage treatment plant, but it was completely clean, would you drink it? Who says yes? Raise your hands. Who says no? No way, Jose. There you go. This may become a reality in the future because who's heard of climate change? <laughs> I think you'd have to be living in that a box not to, okay? Climate change, I, my, my belief is that it is real. Our climate is changing. We're seeing evidence of it all over the place. And in California here, we'll probably see, you know, I've seen the reports from the California EPA, and they, and they have these different scenarios, and they have models projecting what could happen at each of these scenarios going from kind of like we, we lower our emissions all the way to business as usual, we don't do a thing about it. In all cases, we're going to probably lose a lot of our snowpack up in the Sierras. And you guys know where our water comes from? Mammoth. Oh, no. Yeah, there's, mainly it comes from the, uh, the California aqueduct system, okay, that's the California project, which is coming all the way from the river or the delta s system up in San Francisco, Sacramento. Well, that eventually comes, came from the Sierras. Uh, the Owens, Owens River Valley and Owens Lake and all that. So that's the city's project, and that comes right across the passes. Actually, it was an amazing feat of engineering, but we stole all their water and wiped out some environments there. We're putting some of that water back now, so that's less water there. And then the Colorado River project, okay? Well, we're kind of draining that too, so. Yeah, so. <laughs> we're running out of water. And the only other, and we talked about groundwater sources, but they're polluted, but we're cleaning those up, but it takes a while. We blend water. We blend all that water to give us plenty of water. So when you turn the tap on, you got water coming out. But it's going to get more and more expensive. The huge resource of water. Every single day in Santa Monica Bay, we pump out about 320 million gallons of fresh water. We're one of the largest rivers in the entire state, right out your back door here. Hmm. Think of it like that. How environmental is Loyola Marymount University? 
You're tenured, come on. Well, I'd say on a scale of one to 10, I'd say we're probably around a 6.5 to seven. And so what would another university like USC, UCLA, or Pepperdine, what would they be like? Uh, I don't, don't really know. know them very well, but, but you know, I would say probably lower. I mean, we, we do have a lot of stuff going for us. Number one, I think we have a lot of solar panels going on. So As a matter of fact, to... I would like to say that we have the largest solar panel right. of any university in America. Right. So, yeah. so we know we beat those bad guys across the street. Yeah. The, way yeah. there. the other thing is we've had pretty good recycling program going on, although we're getting a lot of heat from our neighbors because it's a rather noisy affair. My building's right over there. Yeah, <laughs> so I know this for a fact. Yeah. You hear this grinding and stuff going on. But we're very serious about our recycling program. We could do a lot better. Who went to the Bellarmine Forum about two years ago? Okay. I actually had a class come up here with trash. You guys remember that? Does anybody attend that particular session? I have a lot of my classes come up with trash. <laughs> Usually the mid. No. Go, go ahead. Uh. Not verbal. <laughs> <laughs> So what they did was, what they did was, as a class project in preparation for the forum, they went around the dorms, the classrooms, some of the food areas, and they fished out. I had them fish out. Uh, I gave them gloves and everything, and they fished right out of the trash. What was in there? I don't want to know. Man. Then they then they kept in well, the dorms especially. They categorized what was recyclable versus what wasn't. They found about half of what was recyclable. Yeah, but doesn't all that trash go over the transfer station and don't they go through it for, so that even though they found it, does, I, I don't know about that. That I don't know. I, I the other thing that. is we were talking about gray water or sometimes it's called toilet water if it does right. come from, but a lot of the gray water also uh, comes toilet from. Toilet water black water. Right. <laughs> so we also are the, as I understand, the only university in Southern California where all of its irrigation is of gray water. And that because we're tied to um, the, Hyper West the West Basin and we come to the Hyperion plant and we're somehow tied to that. Yeah, Hyperion sends about 20 to 30 million gallons a day up to the West Basin water uh, plant where they make it squeaky clean, okay? About half of their water goes into recharging the groundwater mm -hmm. to keep the seawater from coming in and fouling up the, the groundwater. The, a lot of it goes to the, the big um, refineries because they need really pure water for their cooling. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is sent out an extensive system to here to LMU, we're on the line, for irrigation. But we quit using it for a while because it was stinky. How many live in the dorms? Okay, when they were using that at night, what'd you think of that? It was awful, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, come on, it's some environmentalist, a little bit of smell and it's like, oh. Yeah, uh, gonna say. Yeah. But actually, what's, what's interesting now is so wait a minute, it is toilet water then? It was from the water, but what happened is we're mm. so far down the line, there's enough bacteria to start growing again in that that cause those odors. So what, what, what they're doing right now is they actually built a little station on the grounds here, right where it comes in, and they're putting ozone in there. And ozone will wipe out those bacteria so that they could use it without the odor. All right. So, we're, so, we're so we'll be right using all recycled water then all again for, water, for irrigation. For irrigation. For irrigation. Not, not in your showers, not in the drinking no. fountains. Don't worry about that. I don't okay. think. Well, I don't I think. Don't well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could either raise our tuition or use that drinking water. I mean, one of the yeah. two, you'd save a lot of money. Yeah, get money someplace. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Okay. Marks. Two questions. One is mine and one is my student who's too shy to talk into the microphone. My question is, um, there's, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this controversy among scientists, whether the money should be better spent on preventing climate change or basically responding to climate change. So the argument is that for every, like, you know, for the trillions of dollars it's going to take to stop climate change, we should actually be spending that to deal with the impacts that are going to happen anyway, like starvation and lack of sanitation and all that. I just wanted your thoughts on that. And then my student wanted me to ask a question about, um, I guess, the technology of desalinization plants and whether or not that could um, account for the, or, or make up for some of the lack of um, runoff from the Sierras. Right. Um, for the global warming climate change question, w I firmly believe that we need to start doing something now. We, we absolutely have to because I've looked at all the scenarios. There's a group called the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. One of our professors in civil engineering was one of the authors of the fourth report. Yeah. 
And um, I've talked to uh, this Dr. Jeremy Powell, and I've had long is discussions that the, with Is that Jeremy. the one that got the, um, yeah. um, Nobel Prize. the Nobel Prize? He didn't get any money, though. He's always complaining about yeah. that. So. <laughs> one of our professors was a Nobel Prize yeah, winner so, this past um, year. And, and Jeremy's, I mean, he's obviously totally convinced that it's very real. And what's scary is that they've developed these models they are doing these predictions on different things. And then they go back and plot actual data from what the, and to see how the model uh, reacted. And in most cases, not only did it predict it, but the data were actually a little more severe than what the model was predicting in a lot of cases. So, so we're, we're seeing some evidence right now that it is real and it is being generated by too much of the greenhouse gases. So I think we need to start curbing them now, but at the same time, we have no choice. We need to also deal with the impacts that we're starting to see already. And yeah. for Southern California, probably the most severe impacts will be, again, water resources, and that will be worldwide. But we need to start dealing with water, so that means we're going to have to start recycling our water, whether everybody likes it or not. We'll need a better phrase, though, from then toilet to tap, know, okay? So you guys work on that in communications, okay? Uh, probably we're going to get more warm, hot days, okay? So more heat events. We've yeah, had more some, smog then. And then that means more smog events. Yeah. And so that means we need to get more cars off the street, more you know, sensible transportation, which will then go into lowering emissions. So it all kind of actually comes together, okay? It's kind of woven together. It's, it's not like one or the other. So I see it as really kind of putting them all together. But there's really no debate about climate change. I think what uh, the, some of the people that we label as as conservative, it's not that they don't believe in climate change, it's that they say that it's a natural thing. It's not really co being caused by man-made activities, but it's just the natural flow of the earth climate that we've had these climate changes before, mm -hmm. and it was gonna happen whether we were driving around in cars or not. That's, that's true, it's a good point, because we have seen the climate drastically change in the past. Now, I don't believe that, I'm just playing advocate. Well, no, no, you're right, I mean, it has changed in the past, but it's changed like maybe like this. What we've seen is something like that. And it's timed with the Industrial Revolution. Of course. <laughs> so, and, and the levels are, are really high, believe me. Uh, desalinization plants. OK. Um, I'm not an engineer. I don't know too much about desalinization. I do know that they, they did a plant in Santa Barbara, but it was very expensive to run. Energy, it's very energy intensive. And that, I don't think they ever ran it. That's when we were in a real heavy drought, and they were actually painting their lawns well, the brown lawns green up in Santa Barbara, which is yeah. pretty interesting. They weren't allowed to use water for their lawns. But now desalinization has come a long ways. I think, I believe it's the main way a lot of the, uh, like Saudi Arabia and a lot of the countries around the Gulf get their fresh water. And I believe Huntington Beach is going to be investing in a uh, desalinization yeah. plant. But we'll see, but it's a big energy trade off because it's very energy intensive. So you create uh, pollution. Technology. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's that carbon footprint. Right. Okay. So you got to think about that. Yeah, I think Catalina's talked about it as well and others. Uh, right. Dr. Blakesley? I just finished reading a book on National Geographic called uh, Six Degrees. It looked at changes that were occurring in the Arctic Circle during the Glacial Age. Right. Um, I guess all of you have seen probably L.A. River or Bayana Creek during a heavy rainstorm. It's pretty spectacular. We do, and, and you're right, we get all of our rain in about six or seven events. And um, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I know that San Francisco, I think they've got some really deep tunnel storage type systems. But I imagine doing something like that here would be pretty expensive. Uh, Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think that's going to be it. I think it's trying to get rid of all the hardscape and get more areas where you can soak it into the ground. That's why we have so much runoff is because we don't allow it to soak into the ground. We have paved over our entire right. area pretty much. So the more we get unpaved, the more we can get into the ground to ref Right. Exactly. E even households. You can get right down to the houses. You don't have to have uh, rain gutters that go straight off into the streets. Okay. You could have a system where you can have a deep, um, when you have your rain spout, your downspout coming down, it could be a box, a very large box that starts off with gravel going down to sand, going down to your native soil so that at least you got a chance to soak that water back into the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, there's probably a lot of ways. It's probably not one big system, but a whole bunch of small distributed systems. That's what I would probably think would be the way to go for our area. So we have in the city of Los Angeles 4 million people, in the county of Los Angeles 10 million people, and what we call Southern California 18 to 19 million people. Without the water from the California project or the LA aqueduct or the Colorado River, what is naturally what the... Um, indigenous water supply would be able to support? Oh boy, <laughs> a couple hundred thousand maybe. <laughs> wow, not even a million? Maybe a million, I don't know. It, it'd, be, it'd be probably even less than that. Wow, so that the only reason Los Angeles exists, the size that it does, yeah. is our engineering ability to bring water. Right, I think it was Mohan that really got the right. ball rolling for bringing in the water from on the other side of the Sierra. It's around the right. eastern right. side. Mm -hmm. So, um, We've talked about the river, and I've read, not from biologists or whatever, but from social critics, that the river in Los Angeles, which is, Jill, how many miles when it starts up in the... It, the total is 51 miles, and within the city of LA, we have 32. Okay. The river's only 51 miles. That its altitude, or the, its degree, or, or, or its drop, that means from the first mile to the last, that it drops more in 51 miles than the Mississippi River drops in over 1,000 miles, okay? So what that means is that when it rains, that water starts coming down there fast. Mm -hmm. And so that, that it, and so we have to go back and remember that every time it rained, that water came down fast. And what did it do? It flooded homes. The river never really, it changed its banks it was, a, it was a major social problem for the people of that time. It, I think at times it went, used to come out through buying a creek system. Right. Yeah, right. so it really changed courses. <laughs> right. So that what the um, officials of Los Angeles and the population at that time was 100% behind this. I know we're somewhat critical of it now, and we know a little bit more in terms of the impacts, but they wanted that river to be tamed. They wanted the channels, and they wanted the concrete. I think it was after yeah. about the 1932 storms. Yeah, they lost, not only did they lose property, but a lot of lives were lost. So it was, so I wanna, mm. when, we, when we created this concrete bunker that, it, it, that we now criticize, you have to remember that that was the solution to a major problem facing the city at that time, mm -hmm. okay? And as a good progressives, they knew it was a technical solution. They hired a technician. They did the political autonomy. They had a tangible target, tame that river. They did actually an excellent job. And they had, but for what, the, what they saw as the challenge. You, so understand that when they did that, it wasn't a mistake. It was actually a great, tremendous success of the Army Corps of Engineers and the, the city of Los Angeles. It was a big public works project. Yeah, and they hired a lot of people, a lot of contracts, a lot of patronage. I mean, I didn't say that. A lot of uh, different things that came, came out of that. So, and now we know to some extent it was a mistake, but maybe not. I mean, what would you do differently? Because we couldn't have developed a large part of Los Angeles, could not have been developed without taming that river because cities like Lakewood or Bellflower, places like that, or around Bell Gardens or you know, um, downtown, It'd all be, you couldn't live there. They'd be flooded consistently. Mm -hmm. What would you do differently? I wouldn't, pro I would probably not make it solid concrete. I would have enough 
concrete in there to maintain a flood control, but at the same time allow natural vegetation to grow up. I think I've seen plans like that where you could have like sections or you could have cutouts or things like that to allow greenery. Um, there's a lot of sides of the Bionic Creek that are like this, okay? Mm -hmm. We probably don't need that. At least if it's a slope like that, you could terrace it. You could have the right kinds of what they call riparian vegetation. This is stream bank vegetation that's used to being ripped out and flooded and everything, but it'll rapidly grow back, okay? That, I mean, I don't care where you are in the world, people go to the water. Okay, whenever I travel, I have to go see some water. I can't right. stand not seeing water. Well, it's a natural, it's, it's a where natural most city thing. starts. That's right. And think of the economic resource of having a nice river to go and look at, you know. So if you could, if you could just soften up those banks a little bit. Um, Jill mentioned one part of the river where the bottom is not concrete. It's, it's pretty amazing when you see it because... I've been up and down that river at the bottom in, in uh, you know, small trucks and things, sampling and stuff. And you look up towards Glendale area from around, I don't know, by the bridges there in downtown where it curves around. And you look up there and it's this wall of green with solid trees at certain times of the mm. year. It's an amazing sight, you know. You look behind, I mean, here's all the, the walls full of graffiti and everything. So it's a really interesting graffiti if you're into that kind of stuff. And you look straight up and there's a jungle in front of you. That's because... There's some sediment there. There's some natural native sediment. For the, the reason that there's no concrete there is because there's groundwater there. And it would lift up that concrete, even though they could make it really <coughs> thick. It's still too much uh, water there. So there's no concrete there. If you could soften up so that you can maintain flood control, but at the same time have native plants, that'd be fantastic. That would draw people, yeah. especially uh, parks alongside. Yeah, so about two thirds of the students are seniors. They're going to graduate in May, go make money, and then contribute to LMU. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other third are juniors. If they were interested in taking a class that talks about this, because they have an elective and they're sick and tired of uh, poli-sci, uh, <laughs> but not Chicano studies, um, what, what kind of classes are offered in biology that a senior could take as an elective that uh, they don't have to know too much science? Well, if you're a junior, you want to take upper division, right? Right. You don't want to fiddle around with... Um, that lower division jazz. <laughs> no, they, they shouldn't, right? Um, well, I'm not really sure we're not structured, but... I just gave you a chance to recruit and all that. On, hang on, we're, we're not finished here. We've got a brand new miner. I believe it's just about through the mill here, so it's going to be on the books pretty soon, in environmental studies. And we're going to have some really interesting coursework. We're going to have some team taught courses. And the capstone course will be one where you go out and you work in the community on projects, things like that. So this is all being developed right now. And I believe it's going through the committee that approves these new kind of programs. So hopefully, um, maybe in the fall, we'll actually start to see that put into place, certainly the following year. So if you're sophomores in here and stuff, you know, think about that one. OK. Okay, one more question from one more radical. Do you have a question? I don't have a question. I just wanted to talk. Well, no, then get the mic then. Yeah, I know. This is a typical uh, activist. Nothing. I don't have a question, but I want to make a statement. Dr. Guetta, I just wanted to share with you. and Oh, just with me? Okay, then. We're over. Just, just with you. Everyone can cover theirs. No. Um, if you want to take an environment class, you can take environmental ethics. It's listed under philosophy with Dr. Right. Brian Trainer. Right. He's very good, too. Yeah. He'd be a great class to take. Thank you. Okay. What, what level course is that? Nice. Yeah. Okay. Hey, let's talk, uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Dorothy for coming over here. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.